In the early 20th century, a man rose to infamy for his cunning and deceitful ways. His name became synonymous with a notorious financial scheme that shook the world of investments and forever changed the way people view financial scams. This man was a master of manipulation, using false promises and clever marketing tactics to swindle millions of dollars from unsuspecting investors. Due to his criminal behavior, he remains one of the most infamous figures in the history of finance, and his legacy continues to influence modern-day investment scams. Without further ado, let's delve into the life and story of the man behind the infamous fraud scheme, Charles Ponzi. Early Life Ponzi's early years came from the man himself, from interviews and his own boastful autobiography. Although it's inherently risky to trust a con man's words, this is the only source of information available. Ponzi claimed that his family was once wealthy, but had fallen on hard times before his birth. He moved to Rome and attended the Sapienza University of Rome, but was forced to leave due to financial difficulties. Coming to America In 1903, Ponzi arrived in Boston with only $2.50 in his pocket, but with $1 million in hopes. His climb to success was long and slow, and he started with odd jobs along the East Coast. He worked as a busboy, waiter, and sign painter, but was fired from each position for stealing or cheating customers. He eventually moved to Canada and found a job as an assistant teller in Zerasi Bank in Montreal where he rose through the ranks quickly. However, the bank owner was operating his own scam, and when the scheme failed, Ponzi was left penniless. Ponzi's Criminal Endeavors Ponzi was caught forging a check and spent three years in prison in Montreal. After becoming a free man, he got involved in smuggling Italian immigrants and was caught again, serving another two years in prison. After his release, he tried to live a straight life, partly due to the influence of Rose Nieko, a young woman he fell in love with and married in 1918. Despite working as a teller for a broker and taking over his father-in-law's grocery store, neither endeavor was successful, and Ponzi soon started looking for another get-rich-quick scheme. Do you know what a Ponzi scheme is? Chances are you might have come across the term. It's named after its creator, Charles Ponzi. But what exactly is it? Understanding the Ponzi Scheme A Ponzi scheme is a type of investment fraud that operates under the principle of robbing Peter to pay Paul. The scheme works by paying off dividends to earlier investors using money from new investors. The latter believe their funds were invested in profitable business ventures and that the person in charge is a successful investor. However, most of the funds are pocketed by the con artist, while the victims receive some money back, which they perceive as profits from legitimate transactions. The biggest downside of a Ponzi scheme is that it requires a continuous flow of new investors to keep going. If the supply of funds dries up, the scheme collapses. That's why the fraudsters work hard to ensure a steady stream of new investments by promising huge profits with no risks. The scam becomes a vicious cycle, as the more profits are paid out, the more new investors are needed, and so on. Differences between Ponzi and Pyramid Schemes Ponzi schemes are often confused with pyramid schemes, but there are some key differences. In a Ponzi scheme, the fraudster acts as the sole operator, and interacts directly with all targets. While in a pyramid scheme, participants need to recruit others to make a profit, creating a layer of separation between them and the original fraudster. Additionally, Ponzi schemes promise profits through obscure investment methods, while pyramid schemes rely on the recruitment of new members. Ponzi schemes are more durable as they require fewer people to sustain. The History of the Ponzi Scheme Contrary to popular belief, Charles Ponzi was not the first person to employ a Ponzi scheme. Adele Spitzetter, a former German actress, 
opened a bank in 1871 and used this method to pay off her investors. But her scam only lasted a little over a year. Similarly, Austrian Johann Baptist Plocht was discovered to be a fraud in 1874, and Sarah Howe in America opened a bank in 1871 offering high interest rates on deposits. Other notable swindlers include William 520% Miller, who defrauded for one million in the 1890s. The IRC Coupon The International Reply Coupon was introduced in 1906 and was meant to be exchanged for the postage stamp necessary to send a letter between two countries who were members of the Universal Postal Union. For example, if a person from the United States sent a letter to France and wanted a reply, they could include an IRC coupon with the letter so the recipient could redeem it for the postage to send a letter in reply. Ponzi had never heard of IRC coupons until he received one from a company in Spain. He wrote many letters to businesses in Europe presenting various ideas and one company wrote back and included an IRC coupon for his reply. The Realization of a Money-Making Opportunity Ponzi realized that inflation caused by World War I meant that there was a slight difference in the value of the stamps that were exchanged using IRCs. The redemption rate of those coupons was fixed through an international treaty, but one could theoretically make a profit by buying IRCs in a different country using currency that had fallen against the dollar, then exchanging them for stamps in the United States and selling those stamps in U.S. currency. If Ponzi bought an IRC in a Spanish post office worth 30 centavos and exchanged it in the U.S. for a stamp worth 5 cents, he'd make a 10% profit. If he scaled up his operation, he could earn substantial dividends. The profit would be even greater if he bought IRCs from countries with the highest inflation. Charles Ponzi had an ambition for arbitrage, buying low in one market and selling high in another. This business strategy was not only common, but also completely legal. Sales Pitch and Investors Ponzi needed people to invest in his plan and came up with a convincing sales pitch. He claimed to have agents all over Europe who bought IRCs in bulk and sent them to him. Ponzi promised returns of 50% in 45 days or 100% in 90 days. But he avoided any other questions on the grounds that it could benefit his competition. In reality, setting up such a business was costly and negated any profits made from IRCs. There were also not enough coupons in the world to sustain Ponzi's growing business. However, these details didn't concern his clients. Getting the money rolling Ponzi tried to get loans from banks, but they declined. He then appealed to the general population and found more success. He made sure not to be too aggressive and only provided details when asked. Ponzi had a talent for connecting with people and this proved to be his greatest asset. In January 1920, Ponzi started the Securities Exchange Company. The money was already rolling in, and this was the next natural step to attract new clients and keep delivering on his promises. He then moved to a larger office in Boston's School Street. The Rise of Ponzi Ponzi was a financial wizard who had the secret to untold wealth. He handled millions of dollars from tens of thousands of investors who were lining up around the block to give him their money. At the height of his success, he was making around $250,000 a day, which allowed him to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. Lavish Lifestyle Ponzi bought a spacious 12-room mansion in Lexington, Massachusetts, and rode around the town in a custom-built chauffeured limousine. He wore expensive tailored suits with diamond tie pins and carried around a gold-handled cane. Some of his more outlandish expenditures included buying a bank that previously rejected his loan application and Poole's brokerage firm, where he used to work just so he could fire his former boss. The Fall of Ponzi The good times lasted less than a year for Ponzi before he got caught. 
It's a surprise that it took that long, as he was not a skilled financier, and his scheme did not stand up to scrutiny from someone who knew what they were talking about. Ponzi managed to delay investigations by successfully suing a financial writer for libel and sweet-talking state officials. From a good relationship to exposing the Ponzi. Charles Ponzi was a man on the rise, thanks in part to his publicist, William McCasters, and the coverage from one of the largest newspapers in England, the Boston Post. In July of 1920, a glowing front-page article was published about Ponzi's rags-to-riches story and his abilities as a financier who could offer unparalleled returns. Little did anyone know this success would lead to Ponzi's downfall. McMasters, who had initially been instrumental in scheduling Ponzi's first interview with the Boston Post, began to have doubts about the validity of his claims. He worked with the newspaper, despite initial hesitation from its acting publisher, to expose Ponzi's fraudulent operations. On July 26th, the day Ponzi collected over $3 million, he was making headlines all over the country, particularly in the Boston Post, which went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for public service after exposing Ponzi's scheme. Credit must also be given to McMasters, for his role in uncovering the truth about Ponzi. Despite the initial fear of a lawsuit, McMasters convinced the Boston Post to pursue the story with the help of District Attorney Nathan Tufts, who promised immunity from any legal action if the expose proved false. The Downfall of Ponzi On August 2nd, the Boston Post published the first-person account by McMasters, with the headline, declares Ponzi is now hopelessly insolvent. The publicist proclaimed that Ponzi was at least $2 million in debt and up to $4.5 million if interest on his outstanding notes was taken into account. The downfall of Ponzi came quick, as he tried to reassure his investors but couldn't stop the government auditors from examining his books. On August 11th, the Post further hastened his demise by revealing that Ponzi had spent time in a prison in Canada for forging checks. An official report from the U.S. Post Office revealed that Ponzi had never cashed in any IRCs in the United States. While an audit concluded that he was $3 million, later revised to $7 million, in debt. The Consequences Charles Ponzi was arrested on federal charges of mail fraud. His downfall led to the collapse of six banks and caused the financial ruin of tens of thousands of people who received less than 30 cents on the dollar on their investments. Ponzi only served three and a half years in prison before being released on parole. However, his freedom was short-lived as he was immediately arrested again on state charges of larceny. He was sentenced to another seven to nine years in prison but appealed the conviction and was released on bail. He quickly fled Massachusetts and ended up in Jacksonville, Florida. No intention of turning straight. Despite the complete collapse of his financial empire, Ponzi had no intention of turning straight. In his own words, no man is ever licked unless he wants to be, and I didn't intend to stay licked. He quickly started another scam that took advantage of the real estate boom in Florida. Sharpon Land Syndicate Ponzi founded the Sharpon Land Syndicate and sold property to unsuspecting investors who were lured by his charm and promises of huge returns on valuable tracts of land. However, what they soon discovered was that they actually purchased worthless swamp land and property that was underwater. Ponzi was arrested again, but managed to post bail and went on the run once more. Escape to Italy It was one too many close calls for the con man, and he decided to escape to Italy. He shaved his head and mustache and secured passage as a crewman aboard a merchant ship headed for Europe. However, his identity was discovered, and Ponzi was arrested in the port of New Orleans. Imprisonment and Deportation Charles Ponzi, the supreme swindler, finally faced the consequences of his actions and served seven years in prison. Upon his release in 1934, 
he was deported to Italy as he never obtained American citizenship. Final Years of Life Despite his notoriety, the final years of Ponzi's life were not well documented. This is due to the lack of coverage in his autobiography and a declining interest in the man from the world. Ponzi had lost his youth, confidence, and cunning by the time he left prison. His wife did not follow him to Italy and eventually divorced him. Life in Italy and Brazil Ponzi did not fare well in his motherland and eventually ended up in Brazil. One version of events states that he was forced to flee after being caught conning people again. Another version suggests that a cousin in the Air Force helped him secure a job with an airline that ran flights between Italy and Brazil. However, the job was short-lived and the airline closed when Brazil joined the Allies during World War II. End of Ponzi's Life In his final years, Ponzi lived in poverty, working as a teacher and translator to make ends meet. A stroke left him partially blind and paralyzed, and he eventually passed away on January 18, 1949, in a charity hospital in Rio de Janeiro. He barely had enough money to cover his own burial. In conclusion, Charles Ponzi's tale is a classic story of rags to riches to rags showcasing how quickly wealth and fame can be gained and lost. Despite not being one of the largest financial fraudsters in terms of the amount of money conned, Ponzi's scheme was one of the most infamous and has left a lasting impact on history. And that brings us to the end of today's video. To keep yourself informed of our latest offerings, we kindly request that you hit the like button, subscribe, and turn on notifications. We hope you had a wonderful time, and until we meet again, Thanks for watching.